Welcome to A Space to Speak Your Mind, a radio program and podcast about mental health and well-being, made by people with lived experiences in association with Cornwall Mind. We do occasionally cover subjects that some listeners may find distressing. For more information and help and support, please visit cornwallmind.org. A Space to Speak Your Mind, with Cornwall Mind. Welcome to the August programme. I'm Claire. And I'm Victoria. On this month's show, we'll be talking about rethinking smartphone use for under 18s to improve mental health with Adam Ferguson, Global Head of Insight at HMD, and Dr. Sanjeev Nachani, a senior consultant, paediatrician, and member of health professionals for Safer Screens. We discover the link between debt and poor mental health with Kevin Mountford, co founder of savings platform Raisin. And we'll learn how writing poetry can be good for your well-being. First, though, let's hear how neurodiversity can have an impact on our mental health with Callum and Claire Reynolds, who is a business psychologist at Pern Candola, talking to Vic. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. It's really been fascinating to read that the new report's been released revealing the workplace discrimination of neurodiverse workers and um, quite horrifying to read that almost half of employees admitted they've experienced discriminatory behaviour towards neurodiverse colleagues. It's thought that there's 15 to 20% of the world's population that's neurodivergent. And we're joined here by Claire Reynolds, business psychologist of Pern Candola. Hi, Claire. Hello, hi there. What are the key findings from this report? Yeah, so there were some positive findings. We found that just over three quarters of people felt included at work. But actually, when you look more specifically about some of their experiences, it was less positive. We know that over half haven't even told their employer that they are um, neurodivergent because they didn't feel comfortable. And then they were fearing the consequences. We know that 63% feel like they have to mask their condition in order to fit in. And that that leads to huge anxiety and stress. We know that 40% are not getting the support that they are legally entitled to, so reasonable adjustments that they should be getting to do the job. And when we asked them about recruitment, nearly half of them felt that recruitment processes were unfair, so essentially biased and weighted against them. So lots of quite concerning findings in the report that employers will, will need to reflect on. Absolutely. What do you think that employers can do to improve on the situation? I think there's a lot of things employers can do and a lot of them are really quite easy and and not very expensive either. So I think the first thing is all about understanding. We need to raise the baseline understanding about neurodiversity amongst the workforce. The level of real understanding about it is very, very low. So all employers should be doing training, good quality training to make sure that everybody understands what it is and how to support their neurodivergent colleagues. And also talk about the benefits. So talk about all the brilliant things that your divergent brain brings to an organisation. When it comes to recruitment, clearly there's more work to do. But employers need to review their whole recruitment process from start to finish and look at all the places where they could be negatively impacting someone who's neurodivergent. Challenge that discrimination when you see it. We want to get to a place where people feel that they can challenge exclusive behaviour to anyone, but in this case to neurodivergent people. And finally, in terms of culture, firms need to be really building that psychological safety so all employees feel that they can take risks without the charts of negative consequences. So everybody needs to feel like they can be themselves, they can disclose their condition, they can come in and just say, I'm dyslexic, I need help and I need support and not feel like there's going to be a downside of doing that. So creating that psychological safety is going to help neurodivergent people, but actually help everybody. So yeah, lots of really simple things that people can do that will have a really big impact. You mentioned about the masking. We know that masking is kind of higher in females. Was there anything sort of gender specific that came out in the study? Not particularly in terms of masking. Um, Obviously, we had a mix sample of genders, but we do know, as you say, that it can have an impact, particularly with autism. We know that women tend to mask more and also autism can show up in a very different way for women and therefore it can be less likely to be spotted or diagnosed. So that does have an impact. But across the board, across the genders, you know, people really talked about the impact it has of masking. You know, it's exhausting. It creates stress. It's not a nice place to be. So we want to get to that place where all employees feel like they can actually just be honest and say, I'm neurodivergent and then I need support. And that will be a much better situation to be in. So there's a bit of a mindset shift that I think needs to change. Absolutely. And you mentioned there are like real positive upsides of being neurodivergent. How do you think they can be really sort of promoted and presented to employers? 
the conversation needs to change a little bit. I think being aware of what those benefits are is the first step. Nobody wants a workforce where everybody thinks the same. It's not good for decision making. We get into that situation of group think where everybody's thinking the same and coming to the same conclusion. That's not good for creativity, not good for innovation. We know that if you're neurodivergent, you're likely to be creative. You may have really an ability to focus very intensely on something which can be amazing for productivity and creativity again. Lots of neurodivergent people have very specialist skills that can be harnessed for an organization. So just becoming more acquainted with the benefits and then just talking about them more, you know, that it's something that for some reason, I think because it's not visible, it gets deprioritized and forgotten about. And that needs to change, whether it's days championing neurodiversity or hearing from individual stories about their neurodiversity, just so that it's something that comes into the conversation a lot more and people understand better. How do you feel that this report can tackle discrimination? Is this going to be something that's sort of presented to business leaders and parliament? What do you sort of see the future with the report? Absolutely. Well, we'll be sending it out to all the organisations that we are in touch with. And we've got it on our website and we're going to be publicising it heavily so that lots of people um, have the benefit of seeing it. In terms of policymakers, I haven't got that far yet, but absolutely it would be great if they could read it too. It's just about an awareness shift that needs to happen across the board in all organisations. So we're definitely hoping it's going to raise the profile, shine a light on this important issue. That's fantastic. Do you think there's anything else that can raise the profile of this going forward? Any thoughts that you have on that? I think it's always really wonderful when you see all the brilliant people who are neurodivergent and just being more aware of that. Richard Branson's the obvious one who always gets quoted as a dyslexic person, but just seeing what actually the neurodivergent brain can achieve is amazing. So having more role models, essentially, certainly having more female role models, because if you look at the famous successful people who are publicly neurodivergent, it's often men. So there need to be more female role models as well. But just generally people that the younger people can look up to and go, oh, okay, I can achieve wonderful things with my brilliant brain, rather than feeling like it's all about challenge and difficulty. Let's bring Callum in. Hi, Callum. Hello. And what's been your experience of the recruitment process and employment for you as a neurodiverse person? You know, for me, my job when I was looking at jobs, I struggled massively in the get go. Nowadays, lots of these big employers, they use these online tests to answer questions of what you would do in this scenario. They ask lots of questions in so many different ways and the answers they give are so similar. It was a struggle to try and work out actually what is the best approach, what's the best answer to give them. And as well as that, I'm part of that 63%. I finally got a job um, several years ago, a retailer. And on my paperwork, I didn't put anything about it because I'm just worried how they're going to take it, how they're going to judge me. I've put it on my job application before and never been successful. Mm. And it was just funny that actually this time I was lucky I got the job on the time that I didn't put anything on the paperwork don't get me wrong I ended up telling them eventually but even then they didn't know how they could support me which is just such a shame in this day and age totally what do you think you bring to the workplace that you bring as a neurodivergent person so I was working in a bakery in a major retailer chain and for me I was looking at the processes on when people come in to what starts when and to try and streamline the processes that we had in place to speed up production to minimize waste as well as saving on the hours that we have people in and did you enjoy that role did you find it quite easy to get stuck into that yeah no it was all right it was just people didn't trust my thoughts that i had on ways to streamline and speed up production my manager She once told me that I would last long in this role just because I won't be able to keep up with the pace. And I was so happy to be able to prove her wrong from going from a part-time role to full-time at another store. And to that point, she apologised eventually, but it was just nice to be able to prove her wrong to actually show that people like me, those neurodiverse people actually have something to give and they're not someone who is just seen with a disability. What do you feel the main barriers are to you as a neurodivergent person? You've mentioned recruitment can be quite tricky. Recruitment massively and as I said before especially when it comes to these questions that they provide and how for people like me and I've, I've heard it from other people they get so confused over those kinds of questions as well as what support they can provide in the actual workplace itself. Nowadays, especially since COVID, it's all hybrid working, so you don't have your own space. It's hot desk, I think they call it, where you go into the workplace and 
you just find somewhere to work. And I think for people like me, I need a quiet workspace. I need somewhere to go to just spread out a bit so I can see what I'm doing clearly. Absolutely. I can totally relate to that. What would your advice be for employers to try and improve the situation that you've experienced? So I think it just comes down to a few simple things. If you listen to the neurodiverse people, see what they need. It doesn't take much and just have a little bit of patience. Yeah, it can take a couple of weeks, if not a couple of months for us to adjust into the workplace. It's a new setting, it's new people, but it's new surroundings and just believe in us. Just have a little bit of faith in us. We can provide for the business. And how can people find out more about the report and about everything you've been doing on this? Yeah, so our report is published on our website, which is perncandola.com, and that's P-E-A-R-N. A-A-N-D-O-L-A. Have a look at the research. And if employers want to know how to support their employees, get in touch with us. We do lots of training that's really easy to implement, that essentially just helps employees know how to support each other if they're neurodivergent and helps managers and recruiters as well. Do get in touch. We'd love to talk to you. That's super. Thank you so much, Claire and Callum. Thank you. welcome. A space to speak your mind. Next up, Stephen joins Claire to talk about neurodivergence and his own lived experience. So I think that was a very interesting uh, conversation to listen to, Claire, about uh, neurodivergence in the workplace. Have you got experience of it yourself? Well, actually, yes. I have been working as a teacher for many years. Okay. And I have worked with students who have dyslexia. And um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting because I currently just returned from Oxford where I was working at a language school with foreign students. And it was particularly focused on those students who had dyslexia. And it's a complicated area in my opinion because if you don't suffer from it yourself, it's very difficult to be able to connect to the students which is what the other teachers were able to do because they had dyslexia themselves because they obviously use the term neurodiverse as a blanket term nowadays and obviously dyslexia is one of those and i know in our conversation earlier you were saying that actually the person who started the company had dyslexia was that right yes the company is called education first and he has dyslexia and um, he decided to build this charity based on his personal experiences. Yeah, and you said he had a manual that was produced, and you, when you read it yourself, you were always trying to look at the differences in there for people that weren't neurodiverse or wasn't Yes, Yes, I, I found it particularly difficult because it was of great harnessing effect. It was an extremely good book, and I think the students were very interested, but actually not all the students there were dyslexic, even though the book was focused for those students who had dyslexia. I personally think that this book was fantastic, catering for learners with this educational need. However, being a teacher without dyslexia, I feel like I would have been interested in getting some kind of training because I have taught to dyslexia in my teaching career. But how well these students are actually supported if you're not someone who has dyslexia. I mean, I'm from a family where I have siblings that have dyslexia, but I personally don't. And how you cater for these students and are more aware of this educational need and how you can go about in making these students really realise their full potential. Yeah, I think for me, it's quite an interesting subject because... It wasn't until I sort of did volunteering in my own later life that I looked at myself and actually wondered, because I looked and thought, you know, actually I think I'm a little bit dyslexic because I always sort of struggled reading certain words and even spelling them correctly. And when I look back at my own working career, it's quite surprising the fact that even though I'd brought this to people's attention in the past, it had always been sort of brushed off. Maybe it was the era I was brought up in. Maybe it was just the employers that I worked for didn't really recognise it. But I know for myself that I actually went for a job where I had to, very similar to Callum, fill out an online test. And every question looked like it was a trick and it was trying to catch me out. And I really didn't know how to approach it. Have you ever had that experience, Claire? Yeah, so I've never worked with anyone with autism, but I've taught students with autism. And there's been a few scenarios where I I have a high level of emotional intelligence. And that was really required in the room when I was teaching my students that I found that one of my students with autism, he was a teenager, he was prone to, for example, harassment, bullying. 
okay. And I had to really make sure that he was really well catered for in the classroom, yep. that he was realizing his learning potential and was able to join in with the other students without there being any stigma towards him whatsoever. Very important you know? indeed, yeah. So as far as support yourself, when because obviously you've told us that you've worked in education, you've worked as a teacher, and I know you told me before today that you've actually worked overseas as well um, in the sort of educational field as well what sort of support have you actually had yourself in understanding about neurodiversity and dyslexia have you have you had training online offline um no so i think there's so much training out there so when you become a teacher you have i mean the the amount of times i've done my level one level two safeguarding training health and safety there is so much training out there however with dyslexia i don't feel like you're always given adequate training we do know for example richard branson has dyslexia that's a very well-known dyslexic alan turner had dyslexia and he's a mathematical genius oh wow so basically there they're is bringing something different aren't they they're, they're bringing different, from a different perspective but there should be no stigma associated with it my brother is dyslexic but he got very good grades at school in english and was that picked up when he was a child you, were your brother no he can read he can write whether it's the correct diagnosis for him i'm not sure but it, there's no correspondence between your iq level so so for example if you have dyslexia it doesn't mean that your brain isn't able to function it doesn't mean that you're not able to reach the same potential as other students yeah you might be given extra time to do your exams for example you might need yeah. someone there with you helping with your word formation and putting your ideas and thoughts onto paper yeah, brilliant. You, yeah. You, yeah. you might need some help with that so it is a different way of thinking and it's very interesting yeah i'll tell you what i thought was very interesting that came out in the study apparently was the fact that women were more likely to hide it for some reason than men were now that actually surprised me but i think in my own experience over my sort of lifetime as a man in my um mid 50s now if i'd have sort of realized when i was much younger that actually i was dyslexic and was very honest about it and very open about it if i'd have realized that with my employer but i think for me as an individual and I think this probably goes for a lot of men. That's why it interested me to hear that women were far less likely to come forward with it than men. But for me, those coping strategies were I had to learn to commit things to memory a lot more than other people. So I would always have to generally ask a lot more questions rather than writing things down. So people would sort of say, oh, you're a bit more of a chatterbox or, you know, I'd have to keep interrupting and asking questions because I couldn't write things down because sometimes I couldn't read back my own writing. And I wouldn't want to admit that, but I'm admitting it now. And I think if I'd have said that to an employer in the early days, I would never have achieved the things that I did in the public speaking realm and things like that. And even working in sort of an entertainment capacity abroad, I would never have achieved those things if I had been able to write things down because I wouldn't have had to get that coping strategy. So in some ways it worked in my favour. So obviously we've discussed quite a lot already about dyslexia and that's only one small part of sort of neurodivergent and the other part obviously of being neurodivergent can be autism can be adhd can be all sorts of things but there's also neurotypical i think generally in everyday life things are set up for i don't want to use the average person but for the everyday person the everyday let's just talk about it in a workplace capacity so arriving at work at a certain time having breaks at a certain time desks being arranged in a certain way so just generally everyday life is set up in a very neurotypical way rather than not to necessarily cater for the neurodivergent person so instead of sort of being focused and really sort of where the individual is really catered for they are kind of immersed into society and their surroundings they have to adapt naturally to their surroundings well i think to a certain extent we can understand that there has to be things done in a certain way but there also has to be an element of flexibility and i suppose that's really what the study was looking at at the fact that most people do things in a certain way 
and maybe that's conditioning maybe it's just because it's, well, it's always been done doesn't necessarily mean it's always the best way to continue to do things and maybe that's where the neurodivergent person comes into their own a bit like Callum did and he actually challenged the fact that maybe we can do things differently maybe we can save some money maybe we can save some time but even his employer as he said wasn't very keen on that change really because maybe it's something that they would like to have brought to the table but somebody else did especially as it was their manager. Have you had one of these experiences in the workplace yourself? I think generally through my lifetime, anybody that would know me over a long period would say that I would always sort of look at things and say, why is it being done this way? Has it always been done that way? Is it achieving the best outcome by doing things this way? So, yeah, I think for myself, and I don't know about you, Claire, whether you've ever experienced this or not, but generally, if I've started a new job and someone said this is the way we do things and this is the way we've always done it and I've said well maybe after a few weeks or a few months do you think we could do it differently I've always always been sort of said no well, this is the way it's always been done we don't have change here it's been an eye-opener throughout my life really the fact that people don't like change and maybe that is because they've never experienced I suppose the neurodivergence and they are very neurotypical. A space to speak your mind with Cornwall Mind. Now let's hear from Richard chatting to Dr Sanjeev Nishani and Adam Ferguson about children using their smartphones and how it affects their well-being. As we get into the summer holidays, we're learning that half of parents believe social media apps and smartphone use has changed their children's personality, with a third claiming their child has body image issues due to their smartphone use. Two-thirds of parents have concerns about their child's phone use and the impact on their mental health, attention span and social confidence. To discover more, I'm joined by Adam Ferguson, who's the Global Head of Insight at HMD, and Dr Sanjeev Nakshani, who's a Senior Consulting Paediatrician and Member of Health Professionals for Safer Screens. So Adam, if I can start with you first, what else have you found out about the impact of smartphone use on young people? Well, uh, HMD has conducted research where we've spoken to 10,000 parents across a number of different countries globally, parents of kids the age of 5 to 16. And what we're hearing is this real perception that the mental health of their young ones is being impacted by the use of devices, the use of things like social media. So, for example, over half of them, 54% of the parents we spoke to, wish they'd waited longer when it came to giving their child a phone. And that could be, you know, maybe they chose to give it young, maybe they chose to wait. But regardless of that, over half wish they'd waited. And that's probably because two thirds actually have concerns over the impact on their child's mental health. And that could be linked to concentration, it could be linked to self-image, a number of different areas. And then possibly speaking as a parent, the scariest thing that sort of we've seen is that almost half perceive that there has been a fundamental change in their child's personality due to this. And that then sort of leads us to this situation where people are having to reach out and create their own solutions because they don't feel as if there is a tailor-made solution available in the market. Two thirds of them, again, are saying that they've had to sort of cobble their own solutions together. Hence the introduction of the Better Phone Project. And what we are going to be doing is really going on a journey with anyone who wants to be involved in the creation of potential solutions to this issue. And we want to do it in conjunction. We don't want to do it in isolation. So we're throwing the doors open because it's really going to improve the eventual proposed solutions. So in a nutshell, people can go to hmd.com slash better phone project and they can then apply or sign up rather to various sessions and webinars and input sessions that we're going to be hosting where we draw on all of this amazing knowledge from all of the passionate people who feel strongly about this topic and then present back the ideas of what a solution could look like and probably have those ideas torn apart and then we'll iterate and we'll go back again and, and maybe we'll have that torn apart as well. But eventually we're looking to get to a space where we have really listened and incorporated the views of concerned people, whether that's parents for their young ones or or young adults or people who have been affected by this directly themselves. So that's what we're trying to do with the Better Phone Project. So Dr Sanjeev, I mean, there is so much pressure, isn't there, for 
children being included by having their mobile phones. There are benefits to having the phones for communication and to know where your child is, but there is so much pressure, isn't there? So what can parents do to address the concerns that they have with the children, especially as we go into these summer months where the children are at home, maybe they're using their phones more as they wouldn't necessarily do in the classroom? What can parents do? It is a very difficult problem, and Adam has summed up the research. His research, the HMD research chimed with all the other research that there is out there, and in fact, what I see clinically. So parents do have a difficult problem. We have to acknowledge that. But of course, they are also part of the solution. They need to lead by example because far too many children are following what their parents are doing. So they need to start leading by example. Parenting is difficult. There's no question about it. But of course, currently, whilst there are holidays, and yes, some parents are working, we do have the benefit of relatively better weather. So parents need to encourage their children to take part in outdoor activities. There are guidelines that we have now published suggesting to parents how much time that their children should spend on social media and screens and very, very quickly. For zero to two-year-olds, there shouldn't be any screen time apart from video chatting. For two to five-year-olds, it should be half an hour, definitely not more than one hour. For six to 10-year-olds, there should be during weekdays, one or two hours and two hours on weekends. And 11 to 17-year-olds, two hours on weekdays and two or three hours on weekends. So these are the parameters parents should work to because we are currently in the middle of a phone-based childhood and we are looking to moderate. We're looking for reasonable phone use because as you've already said, smartphones have benefits. However, what has happened, it's gone too far the other way. 30% of children are spending four or five hours each and every day on smartphones. So this is now becoming an addiction to the great detriment of the mental health of children and young people and early development problems with language delays and communication issues. So to tackle this, starting with this summer, summer camps, time outside as much as possible, friends and family need to play a role to try to reduce the amount of time children are spending on their screens and on apps. And over in the fullness of time, we need to change as a society. Government needs to play a role, healthcare professionals like health professionals for safer screen need to play a role, education, public health image, messaging, etc., etc. I'm just wondering from your own experience, is this something you've seen coming over a long period of time or is it more recently? How does that manifest from the people that you're actually seeing? We're talking about mental health. What are the sort of things that you're finding with the children? So uh, there's a whole spectrum. These practices became embedded during the pandemic. We need to stop now as the pandemic has receded. Fortunately, we need to stop blaming the pandemic for this. And essentially what I'm seeing, and this is relatively recent, is that I'm seeing non-verbal children coming to my clinic, so two or three-year-olds with normal mobility and coordination, walk into my clinic room but don't say a word. When you delve deeper into why that might be the case, because this is a relatively new phenomenon, you find out that they're in fact spending most of their waking hours in front of a screen. So they're not hearing vocabulary, there's not much adult sibling family interaction, and then not learning languages. The communication goes are really delayed. And then to the other end of the spectrum, if you look at NHS statistics, 20% of 8 to 25-year-olds have a mental health problem. And there is now a clear causal link between excessive screen time, social media apps, and mental health difficulties in children and young people manifest as inattention, low mood, lethargy, poor sleep, and of course, all the other problems of body dysmorphia, online bullying, etc. So there's a number of manifestations. The bottom line is this is very, very serious. We are in the middle of a screen demic, and we need to start tackling this as soon as possible before it gets even worse. And just remind us where we can find out about the Better Phone Project. So you can either just search HMD, the Better Phone Project, or if you go to hmd.com slash Better Phone Project, that is where you can sign up directly. And then you'll be contacted as soon as things like the webinars and events and forums and the ability to sort of input goes live, probably across the month of September, you'll be contacted directly to see what you want to get involved in. So people can find out more if they go on there and have a look and hopefully get involved in the project. For now, that's Adam Ferguson, who's the Global 
Global Head of Insight and HMD and Senior Consultant Paediatrician, Dr. Sanjeev Nachani. Richard, thank you so much. Thank you. Did you have any thoughts, Claire, after listening to that interview? Yeah, so I found it very interesting. It's a topic that I'm especially interested in, the social media and the effects it has on young people, especially in teenagers. I think it's especially prevalent in teenagers. I mean, it's quite common knowledge, being a teacher, it's a common occurrence. The students would be on their phones, teenagers would be on their phones all the time. But it's starting to actually have an effect on children now as well. It's kind of the social media buck is trickling down to the young children. And what's interesting to me is it is the fault of them, themselves, the parents, you know, the teachers, the educators, and the fact that it's very worrying that they're having language delays and this could be neurological problems at a cause of the usage of too much social media. It's it's extremely worrying indeed. There's some really powerful statistics there, and I think it's interesting that it was a global research project which just goes to show that it's happening across multiple cultures. I think what really stuck for me was what they said about leading by example as a parent. When they're on their smartphones, I think it's really important that we all think about limiting our time on screens, especially if we have children and they're looking up to us. And I think the more that we can focus on other things, other activities in life, they talked a lot about outdoor activity and there's obviously many other things that you can do in indoors and yeah I guess just having that awareness and smartphones are a new addiction and you know the fact that they're thinking about incorporating summer camps outside for students to be on I think that'll be very good I lived in Spain and I worked on a summer camp in Spain and they're quite popular out there they do actually have summer camps in many areas of Spain where children can be sent during their summers and they don't spend loads of time on their phones so I actually think that that's a really really good thing that they're deciding to create these summer camps for young children so that they can spend less time on their phones. I think it's important to acknowledge that smartphones are really useful in today's society you know having a mini computer in your pocket but I think it's also really important that we all recognize the negative impacts that it can have on our mental health and our children's as well so the more awareness that is spread about that the less time we will be spending i'm on my phone quite a lot it's less face-to-face communication you know you go into the staff room and someone says to you okay you know it's all on whatsapp you don't need to discuss anything as much um, which i don't know what you think about that whether that's necessarily a good thing or whether that's a bad thing whether face-to-face communication is decreasing i think that's definitely probably the case yeah i think one-to-one communication in real life is really important for developing your social skills and understanding of people and relationships so yeah if we're deducting that that's not ideal is it really a space to speak your mind with cornwall mind Hi, I'm here talking to Claire about her poetry and how that impacts on her mental health. Claire, would you like to start us off by reading the poem that you've brought with you today? Of course, that would be great. Okay, so I hope you enjoy this poem. It's on the topic of depression. It's likened to a dark cloud in cumbersome, a heavy burden on those perhaps not close-knit, in a fit of giggles as his niece does earnestly wiggle. Or am I to see him in his charm and glory, read him a bedtime story, but my face is wan, shadows under my eyes, but there are no goodbyes of strength and certitude. I am more than astute and clever. My place in this world is subdued to seek admonishment, seeking solace and aid from those less weakened by the devil who acquire approval from God. I'm in his righteous pathway. He'll tell me each less rapturous night in solitude that I'm here to stay. With less guilt and more divinity and guidance, I exist to seclusively be me. With gaiety, I'll face the tangible truth that I can tolerate a less dark and dismal day. Thanks for sharing, Claire. That was very powerful words there i'd really love to hear a bit more about 
how you feel when you're writing this down and does it just flow really naturally or are there some things that you have to kind of reconsider as you're writing to be honest my poems seem to flow naturally as you mentioned normally what I tend to do is I think of a theme or a topic of interest and then write a poem related to that theme which interests me but also supports my well-being because I'm someone who suffers from a mental illness so writing poetry enables me to be more in tune with myself be more creative it can help me deal with my stress levels you could say it's therapeutic in a way but it's um It's definitely a way to sort of be with yourself in the realms of the English language, which is so rich and so powerful, the imagery and language that you can conjure up and put into a poem like this one. It's really amazing. Amazing. I was wondering if you could just reread the first few lines, because I think you use some really strong imagery of the feeling that you get when you're depressed and I just love to hear that again it's likened to a dark cloud and cumbersome a heavy burden on those perhaps not close knit in a fit of giggles as his niece does earnestly wiggle or am I to see him in his charm and glory amazing as you can see that I have rhymes a few of those words there's giggles and wiggles so I do use rhyme apparently my poetry I've been told because I'm part of the fam of poetry society and they've told me that I use traditional prose yeah so the imagery that I get when you talk about being shrouded in darkness is a really lonely and dark place when you feel depressed and what you mentioned about giggling is that you're imagining depression laughing at you because it's got um, its yeah. grip well, on I you well I think that sometimes I feel like with my poems other people's interpretations can be different to my interpretations I just love hearing what people's what they have gained from the poem themselves and what they have interpreted from it but yeah no I think a heavy bird on those perhaps not close-knit in a fit of giggles and his niece does earnestly wiggle so that is basically saying he's relying a lot on his parents so he has his mental illness and he's relying on his parents it's a burden it's encumbersome it's heavy and his niece is giggling and wriggling he's new to the family but he can't really appreciate it so it's kind of a burden for the family they're not close-knit they're not very close however he feels like he can't appreciate his niece you know giggling and right thank you for that insight there in terms of language in general how old were you when you felt really enthusiastic about its potential in terms of storytelling and expression yeah so I was always an avid reader when I was a child I was similar to Matilda you know I was always reading all the time and I started story writing so I'm for example now I'm writing a book and as a child I didn't write anything as a child actually it wasn't it's not until recently that I've started writing poetry I just picked up a poetry book one day and I was reading the poems. I've always had a natural flair for English. I teach English. So basically it's um, something that comes quite naturally to me and I think that at school I enjoyed poetry. Up until recently I've actually started poetry writing and I've written an anthology now which is a collection of poems and they tend to be about the Cornish life, simplicities of the lifestyle down in Cornwall and the people especially and I just really enjoy it and then I decided to write this poem especially for the show. I was just wondering if you are using your poetry as a tool for expression and to process some of maybe the more negative feelings that you might have, what do you feel like before you've written a poem compared to what you feel like afterwards? Yeah, I think that I'm very imaginative and I'm very creative, so I feel very happy afterwards. You can sort of juxtapose that to how the person in this poem is feeling because I feel a great euphoric feeling after I've written the poem however not all the themes are nice and bright in my poems you know they can be about depression and poverty and different areas of societal pressures as well including xenophobia for example 
But yeah, no, I feel very well after I've written a poem. I really enjoy the feeling it gives me. And it just makes me want to write more. It gives you sort of this empowerment where once you've written one poem, I think that you want to continue writing more. That's why I've written this collection. Nice. (laughs) It's easy to get the poetry bug then. If our listeners would like to get started and express some of their own emotions through poetry... What's a good way for them to do that? I probably think that the best thing to do is choose some topics that really interest you and inspire you to write. Because if, for example, like this one is about depression, but I don't write traditional poems about love so much, you know, and I think that um, love on nature, especially traditional poems that are about love and nature, it doesn't necessarily mean that if you pick up a poetry book and you read a poem about nature that you're going to immediately think, okay, well, I I don't really want to write about nature. Well, you don't have to. You can choose a theme that's interesting for you and then write about that theme. Anything that's of interest, really, and be inspired by poems that you read and maybe join a society like I have and meet other poets that are also writing because they can critique your work which is what they do with mine they critique my work so they tell me what they think how it can be improved and it's great stuff do you ever write a poem that's about a feeling that you've had and then like you said you feel euphoric afterwards and maybe time passes do you ever go back to that poem and think gosh I was in a really different mindset when I wrote that and I don't feel like that now and how does that feel yeah definitely so it's different mindset so do you kind of mean the temperament I suppose I mean in terms of some people journal don't they so you might have written in your diary and you might have had a particularly bad day and then sometimes you'll look back and go gosh I did have a really bad day then and like look how far I've come yeah in terms of like expressing my emotions and like maybe feeling a bit more positive since that day does that make sense yeah so the positivity that I feel since I've started writing poetry yeah yeah no I feel a lot more positive in myself it's something that kind of enables me to express myself because I'm not so amazingly well at expressing myself in other ways for example I um, I suffer from social anxiety and I'm not the most sociable of people so finding other things to do that kind of keep my brain occupied I'm very introverted as well so writing poetry gives me solitude and I can do it the comfort of my home and I can spend hours on end writing and um, it's something that I don't get bored with which I think is very important if you're feeling kind of down or dejected in any way I'm like this person is I think that it's a good way of expressing yourself and the amount of positive emotions that it brings is very evident that poetry has many benefits to your mental well-being Why do you think it's important to get those thoughts and feelings out of your head and onto paper? I think it's important because I think that everybody needs a way to express themselves. Even if you don't suffer from a mental illness, happiness is an emotion. So some days you feel very uplifted and other days you don't feel as well in yourself. So I believe that if you put pen to paper, it's giving you that way to express yourselves in a way that's unique to yourself. It's your ideas that you're bringing on the paper. So when you read a book or you read a poem, it takes you to a different place. It's amazing. However, those are someone else's words. So if you put your own words down onto paper, it's very rewarding. It's very gratifying to then read back a poem that you've written yourself. And you think, wow, did I really accomplish that? And what emotions was I feeling when I wrote that poem, you know, and has that been expressed in what I've written? Because I think that's very common for poets to express themselves depending on the emotions they feel. Or for me, it tends to be what things that I'm kind of interested in. But I love English, so it's the wordplay. I love the wordplay language acquisition and um, the playing with words. I, I really, really enjoy that. Everyone has different hobbies and interests and different ways of expressing themselves. Some people use music, some people use sport, 
there's so many things out there that you can do that can help you express yourselves but yeah no for me poetry is a really great form of expression well thank you so much for sharing your poem that you wrote especially for the show it's been a really amazing opportunity to hear it and yeah it sounds like poetry is an incredible tool to get those thoughts and expression out of your head and locked in on the paper and thank you a space to speak your mind with cornwall mind now we welcome to the show kevin mountford co-founder of savings platform raisin to find out the link between debt and poor mental health Keeping track of money can be hard, but for some people, they're turning away from knowing how much debt they're truly in. With 1 in 10 of those under 25 only first taking notice of their debt when they see debt collection activity. When it comes to the reminders from banks, 1 in 4 women agree that banking push notifications about spending negatively impact their mental health, going up to 31% for men. And just across the Tamar, Plymouth is the debt capital of the UK, with residents averaging £1,876 of debt and people aged between 35 and 44 having the highest level of debt. And to find out more, I'm joined by Kevin Manford, who is a saving expert. So thank you for being here, Kevin. Yeah, thank you for having me. Were you surprised by this research? Raising over time as conducted a various kind of research programs and there are some common themes that came out of the latest one particularly around individuals that either lose control of their finances or don't feel empowered because of lack of knowledge so as i say there are elements of that that wouldn't surprise me equally we have tended to be a nation of borrowers So if we look at the average and yes plymouth was the highest region or city in the research but On average, £1,230 per person. That's not per household. But borrowing money in itself isn't a problem as long as you have the means to pay it back and you're doing it responsibly. So we talk about the industry being responsible lenders. We need to be responsible borrowers. But the worrying thing in this is the fact that, as you've just referenced, one in 10 people are burying their head in the sands when it comes to dealing with debt. And yet the first thing we need to do is recognise there's a problem and then take action to try and mitigate the impact, not just financially, but also around our mental well-being. Are you seeing a particular rise in debt in certain areas? I mean, I'm thinking we've had discussions on the show before about rent and about property. Is that a big concern or is it the living cost? What are you finding? I think we tend to be a nation of borrowers. So we seem to have an attitude that if we want something, we will borrow to get it sooner rather than later. And we're aware of things like buy now, pay later schemes. And that's maybe where in kind of retail stores, clothing stores, et cetera, younger consumers are lured into these things. And they're okay because they're generally 0% interest. But if you go outside of the terms and conditions or take in extra borrowing, they're generally at high interest rates. I think on top of that, there'll be some changes in normal behavior as a consequence of cost of living and the pressure that that brings. And whilst that's now seemingly under control, it means that the Bank of England have had to do significant rises on interest rates, and that will have an impact on people who've got mortgage borrowing or unsecured lending that's aligned to interest rate changes. So it doesn't surprise me that the problem has increased to an extent, but as I say, the important thing is taking some action, doing something about it. And it's really acknowledging when that's happening, isn't it? So it's spotting these spending patterns and it's that spiral effect, isn't it, really, of how things can accumulate over time? It is, but again, our research shows that nearly 30% of people that we asked believe they can't identify patterns or habits in spending make. And this contributes to debt accumulation. So there's one thing getting into debt and in a situation you can't control and ignoring it, but the other is to try and spot early trends. And I think one of the things you mentioned that technology and the kind of push notifications adds to the stress, and I can understand that. In fact, again, the previous research is showing it affects people's sleeping patterns, it impacts the kind of family well-being. So there are kind of compounding effects here, but technology also means that we can keep sight of our spending And I think this is equally important as we use more contactless cards, but track your spending, check your account on a regular basis. Because amongst other things, it also alerts you to unusual transactions that may be fraudulent. So we've got busy lives, but our financial well-being is important and just keep an eye on what's going on. 
and also our emotional well-being. I talked there before about the link between debt and mental health. I suppose for someone who's feeling quite overwhelmed in their life, this is an added extra, but also it has that cumulative effect that if you are experiencing high levels of debt, it will affect your mental health as well. It will. And we talk about problems shared, ease some of the pressure. So as I say, talk to your provider if you feel that you're out of control. There is increased regulatory responsibility on banks, building societies under what we call consumer duty. So there's an obligation to kind of protect vulnerable customers. Budgeting is important. And I think as a family, maybe sit down and look at income and outgoings. And I've just recently changed my insurance provider, saved £120. Would have been really easy to ignore it and just let the policy to roll over. So check your products and services. I still believe most people can cut their outgoings, but do it as a family. There's lots of online budgeting apps that help as well. So try and use technology as a cause for good. And this is somewhere that people can get information on these kinds of things if they're not too tech savvy, but they just want to find out some of these tips that you're talking about here. Yeah, there's lots of online advice. There's apps and tools to help. If anybody's got real debt problems, there are charitable agencies. But for anybody who is able to put some money aside and save, then raisin.co.uk has lots of competitive products there. But we also store the content and the commentary relating to the research as well. So if you want to go and look at it in a bit more detail, it is available on our website. I'm just interested, as well as you were saying, that sometimes we bury our head in the sands. I think sometimes that is the worst thing we can possibly do. If someone was struggling, what would your advice be as far as approaching the organisations, the banks or whoever your lender is? Because there are mitigation things that can happen if you do identify things quite early, aren't there? Yeah, there are. And as I say, at least then you feel you've taken some positive action. Like a lot of problems, if we don't talk about them or we don't share them, it compounds the impact. And as I say, as kind of negative ramifications, whether it be pressure on family, your inability to sleep at night, and just general worry isn't good. So talk to somebody. You will find particularly now the industry is more empathetic than it would have been in the past. But take action. That's the first step. And then obviously you can then make some adjustments to try and reduce your outgoings and try and get a little bit more control back. And definitely, and as we're saying, you know, it can affect your mental health. You want to be mentally well. So looking at these issues as early as possible and getting the help is going to help yourself as well and make you more able to cope in these situations. Well, most definitely. We've all got busy lives. And as I say, financial products and services isn't always at the forefront of our mind. But by ignoring that, we could end up getting ourselves into trouble and there's a compound effect of that. So recognise there's a problem, face the facts and do something about it as soon as you possibly can. So lots of advice there. So thank you so much. That's Kevin Mountford, who's a saving expert for being here on the show today. Thanks for having me. Thanks again to Kevin Mountford. That's all for this month's show. Thanks for listening and we look forward to you joining us for the September show. If you missed anything on today's show, you can download the podcast right now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify and Amazon Podcasts. For support and more information for better mental health, visit cornwallmind.org or call the Mind Helpline during office hours on 0300 123 3393. Or phone the 24-7 NHS Local Urgent Mental Health Response phone line. It's free to access by anyone, any age, on 0800 038 5300. And don't forget, you can call the Samaritans anytime for free on 116 123. If you'd like to be a part of the show, you get in contact, just email us at a space to speak your mind at gmail.com. And also, don't forget to like us on Facebook. <laughs>